All right, kids, with what I show you and share with you here, there are some guidelines that I keep in mind which are mostly left unspoken. I got my rules, I count them. One, if and when people in power put barriers and obstacles in your way, tell them that there's no excuse to not run as hard and as far and as fast as you can. Two, when talking about the ills of the world like America's systems, structures, and institutions with how they negatively affect people's lives, do so without mentioning if they impact me personally. I should be willing to address these issues regardless. Three, cite my sources and display my references. Don't just rely on one person for information. Now, as a YouTuber, content creator, and political commentator who makes videos, and since those come with comment sections, people want to share stuff with me too. Here's what they want to show me. This presenter needs to read some Thomas Sowell. Be careful you dig around in history too long and you'll end up finding a red pill. If you're open-minded, you may find one of my favorites interesting, Thomas Sowell. Hmm. Then along comes Thomas Sowell who says differently, cherry picking is bad business. Here, leave you with this video by Thomas Sowell, who is a black American and one of the most brilliant men America has produced. I posted in video by Thomas Sowell. All of these comments, and trust me, there are more just like them, have a few things in common. Nameless and or faceless accounts who are responding to a video I made about the myth of the Irish being enslaved in America, it's in the title, and clearly, of course, I'm told to read about or watch Thomas Sowell, as if I've never heard of him. I know who Thomas Sowell is, which is what and who we're going to talk about today. And before I continue, Thomas Sowell is a brilliant man, an excellent economist, a writer, an author, an orator. He was a Marine. He has contributed to social commentary and research. I can't cover all that he has done. He's currently in his 90s and still getting it in. But most important to his fans, he's a black conservative. This man has reached myth and legend status a few times over to conservatives. He's a wise old sage, an N-word Yoda. In Yoda, for people who claim they don't see color. To many, no one engages in the arguments of Thomas Sowell. And you know what? There are things that he has said that I disagree with. And I'm nobody. But to others, Thomas Sowell is someone known to talk about rather than with African Americans. Well, since my inbox contains a lot of links to Tommy Boy's videos about the topic, our focus will be on U.S. chattel slavery, America's involvement with the transatlantic slave trade. And Thomas Sowell has written about this extensively. I'm not going to pretend like I've read most of the material in most of his books. Luckily for us, there are a bunch of YouTube channels dedicated to his work with multiple successful, highly viewed videos that get sent to me, usually called Something Something Thomas Sowell, Something Something Destroys. Some of these feature interviews, and we'll get to one later, but there are more than enough of people reading excerpts from his books. Before the modern era, by and large, Europeans enslaved other Europeans, Asians enslaved other Asians, Africans enslaved other Africans, and the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere enslaved other indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Slavery was not based on race, much less on theories about race. Only relatively late in history did enslavement across racial lines occur on such a scale as to promote an ideology of racism that outlasted the institution of slavery itself. Wherever a separate people were enslaved, they were disdained or despised, whether they were different by country, religion, caste, race, or tribe. This is the video clip that is probably sent to me the most. Again, in response to a video that I made about the Irish not being enslaved in America. I know that the Irish were enslaved elsewhere. I know that white people have been enslaved around the world. This video entitled, Video Facts About Slavery Never Mentioned, is arguing against an argument that I never made. But whatever, Thomas Sowell is right. Slavery has existed in various forms in all of human history. Each race of people, along with many ethnicities, has either been enslaved by others or has enslaved others or both. And before I continue, slavery still exists to this very day around the world, even in a country like Russia. However, there are a few things that made U.S. chattel slavery unique. See, it was the first time that countries or a continent, in this case, Europe, Europeans and American colonists who invented race in order to subjugate what they deemed to be black people as subhuman cross an ocean in order to enslave people from another country or continent, e.g. Africans, starting in Angola. I talked about this in another one of my videos. 
Furthermore, laws were passed in the U.S. colonies to make and keep black people synonymous with slave. A significant turning point came in 1662 when Virginia enacted a law of hereditary slavery, which meant the status of the mother determined the status of the child. This law deviated from English common law, which assigned the legal status of children based on their father's legal status. Thus, children of enslaved women would automatically share the legal status of slave. This doctrine was called partis sequitur ventrum, which means offspring follows the belly or that which is born follows the womb. So a white enslaver would own the mixed race baby that he made with a black woman, his chattel, who would also become his property, born into slavery. Meanwhile, mixed race babies born of white women were typically free. Additionally, in October of 1705, the Virginia General Assembly passed an act concerning servants and slave, which summarizes previous laws defining bound labor in Virginia. It made distinctions between the treatment of white Christian indentured servants and non-white non-Christians, allowing for the killing of slaves in various situations without penalty. The law called for and included, but was not limited to, Rewards for the capture of runaway slaves, lashes by their various legal custodians on the way home, and stiff penalties for any sheriff who allowed the runaways to escape. The law restricted the movement of enslaved people by requiring certificates of leave in writing and limiting their visits to other plantations to four hours without the leave of such slave's master, mistress, or overseer. Oh, and slaves were not protected from what was known as immoderate corrections, like white Christian servants were, meaning should an enslaved person happen to be killed in such correction, lashes, getting whipped, it shall not be counted felony for the master. In fact, the law would treat it as if such incident had never happened. And no, the vast majority of the time, a slave couldn't become a Christian in order to win their freedom. And of course, they couldn't become white. See, the one drop rule, the only law like it in the world. Plus, these laws were also codified in much of colonial America. So, Outside of race, racism, and anti-blackness, why else would these policies be a thing? And you can say that these policies were made to preserve property, and you would be correct. But then you would be admitting that humans were cattle, something that Thomas Sowell would do, but Thomas Sowell fans will follow that up with, well, if Africans didn't sell other Africans. I mean, he might say that too. I'm sorry, did the white wealthy elites of the colonies have to? to go to Africa in order to get free labor? Were there not humans that they could use here in America or in Europe? So it was better slash easier slash cheaper to, as I already mentioned, go across an ocean to trade for West Africans instead of, you know, enslaving poor white people? Why didn't they just do that? Does the ruling class, past and present, not have a, a force, a squad, a unit that could round up and capture the working class, putting them in chains? a chain gang, so that they could be made to work for the state and economic material interests without compensation. Moving on to yet another clip that I'm told to watch a lot, not that I've even talked about retribution for slavery on my channel, but here's Thomas Sowell's response to Tani Hasi Coates' case for reparations. It, 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 it was a rotten system, but I don't know how, how, how we get from that to reparations. I mean, what we see in the United States in terms of the bad things you see all around the world. If you were to give reparations to everyone whose ancestors had been slaves, I suspect that you would have to give reparations to more than half the entire population of the globe. Slavery was not confined to one set of races. I suspect that most of the people who were either slaves or slave owners around the world were neither white nor black. I mean, this was, this was a universal curse of the human species. Well, hold up. We can't just Robin thick our way through this. I hate these blurred lines. Just because one country or people makes a case for reparations doesn't mean others can or can't. Spain and Portugal reserve the right to have a problem with the Moors. The Democratic Republic of Congo can make claim to Belgium's wealth. Australia, India, and South Africa, and every place around the world should demand to be reimbursed due to British occupation. Just look at what Germany has done and is going to do for European Jews and those who died around World War II and for survivors of the Holocaust, along with the Japanese who were provided with reparations for internment in America during World War II, which should have been 
more. Then there's multiple Native American tribes in the U.S. who were provided with some form of reparations, not enough, and enslavers in Washington, D.C. who were paid after the Civil War for lost property. The point is, what other countries have been through largely has nothing to do with us. Furthermore, we can establish a start of America's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. I'll let fans of Tommy Boy choose. How about 1619 or 1776 or 1808 when the US Congress outlawed the African slave trade but kept right on going with it? Anyways, usually when discussing the cause of the Civil War, it's important to bring up why and when the Southern states succeeded from the Union in order to become its own country. Because every state in the Confederacy issued an Articles of Succession declaring their break from the Union. Four states went further. Texas, Mississippi, Georgia, and South Carolina all issued additional documents usually referred to as the Declaration of Causes, which explained their decision to leave the Union. Here's South Carolina's and Georgia's, but I'll actually read Texas's and Mississippi's. Texas made it clear who they wanted to enslave specifically. The servitude of the African race as existing in these states is mutually beneficial to both bond and free and is abundantly authorized and justified by the experience of mankind and the revealed will of the almighty creator as recognized by all Christian nations. Mississippi, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. These products have become necessities of the world, and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. You know what? As you're about to see, what a declaration of cause like Mississippi's made clear is Product and money that came from U.S. shadow slavery went all over the world. This per the BBC. Some of the largest insurance firms in the U.S., New York Life, AIG, and Aetna, sold policies that ensured slave owners would be compensated if the slaves they owned were injured or killed. In 2005, J.P. Morgan Chase, currently the biggest bank in the U.S., admitted that two of its subsidiaries, Citizens Bank and Canal Bank in Louisiana, accepted enslaved people as collateral for loans. If plantation owners defaulted on loan payments, the banks would take ownership of the slaves. J.P. Morgan was not alone. The predecessors that made up Citibank, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo are among a list of well-known U.S. financial firms that benefited from the slave trade. Goods like cotton, which was put in fabrics, of course, were used in clothes for brands like Brooks Brothers, the oldest men's clothier in the U.S., Processed slave-grown sugar cane was sold by Domino Sugar, once the largest sugar refiner in the U.S. This is just a few examples. Even if I felt like making a case for reparations myself, which I don't, I think the onus should be placed on banks, businesses, and organizations who benefited from slavery. So I wouldn't be looking at you, white middle America, even though a number of you set your sights on black people who own black slaves. Would their slaves get reparations? Yes. Yes. It's like a law or system has to have a 100% success rate and be maintained by everybody in it for some to believe that it's racist at all. Like a law has to say, it is our intention that we, as in the state, are trying to make things worse for our particular race of people and only them, that is not us, while simultaneously making things better for ourselves, the majority population, the people in power. A tangent for those who have told me Tell the whole story, which is something they would never say to Thomas Sowell, goes a little something like this. 300,000 or half a million white men died in the Civil War to end slavery and bring about freedom and liberation for black people. Hey, uh, who were those white men in the North fighting? Were they fighting white men that wanted to preserve the institution of slavery? Are those Confederates still here to... Oh, so we're giving credit to the majority population, the people in power with rights and political capabilities who were the only people who could do this 98 out of 100 times, abolish slavery. Got it. The Civil War was fought to preserve the Union, but also black men were Union soldiers, so it's like they freed themselves. This doesn't even include resistance and revolts like the Stono Rebellion or the Louisiana Rebellion, Nat Turner's Rebellion, or even John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Oh my gosh, someone's going to say that there were black Confederate soldiers because Thomas Sowell mentioned it, but can't provide proof that black people actually fought and died in battle. Speaking of emancipation and abolition, 
Real quick. It was not until the late 18th century that there was even an intellectual movement, much less a political movement, for the abolition of slavery. And those in these movements were distinctly in the minority, even in the West, and had no counterparts outside the West. What was historically unusual was the emergence in the late 18th century of a strong moral sense that slavery was so wrong that Christians could not in good conscience enslave anyone or countenance the continuation of this institution among themselves or others. Nor was this view confined to religious leaders or congregations. Haiti, an island in the Western world, fought for its freedom from France and won. They're black. Thomas Sowell didn't mention the Haitian Revolution. Maybe he has. I mean, people mess up and miss some information, but I know he knows about Haiti and what they did. He brought up the island as an example like four times when talking about why discrimination isn't an explanation of economic disparities for black Americans. As I bring this to a close, there's an article called What's Wrong with Thomas Sowell? It addresses black blameworthiness for inequality, but for the purposes of this video, I'll get to the end where the writer asks, why do people love Thomas Sowell? Thomas Sowell, I think it is fair to say, is first and foremost a pundit. He has made his career less on scholarly arguments accountable to the rigorous critique of his peers and more on quotable quips, book link tirades, and debate clap lines for the adulation of his libertarian fans and conservative think tank colleagues. Even though they are hollow when you knock on them, Sowell presents his arguments with confidence and frames the story as being one of an incompetent, mean-spirited, economic left against a sensible, evidence-based economic right. When that is a story you already believe, Sowell's arguments appear compelling and his demeanor is confident and charismatic, but ultimately, Sowell is better at rhetorical flourish than thoughtful empirical analysis or philosophical consistency. I recognize that there's a lot of people who don't even know who Thomas Sowell is, no matter their race, ethnicity, or political ideology. But I do. And he's among many black voices that I listen to or have heard. However, what we ain't going to do is act like he doesn't cherry pick his way through information. It's not imperative for everybody to merely be even aware of him. It's to the point that I'm starting to not even like this dude, not just because of some of the things he says, but because he's the go-to person for people who tell others to do their own research, when in reality, they just watched one of his videos and called it a day. Whatever the audience perceives me to be, now that I would even come close to being on Tommy Boy's level, I never want to be the one person they listen to. Why does it seem like Thomas Sowell is the only black person that so many listen to? For a lot of people, he co-signs anti-black, preconceived notions, whether he knows it or not. He confirms a lot of bias, whether he intends to or not. Because the way black conservatives will have us believe, if I didn't take it upon myself to read more, I would think that Anthony Johnson, a black man, was the first slave owner in America. So we gonna be all right. Not you.